Okay. Part two. So if I can say, okay, here are the uh, 22 letters of the alphabet. There's the Mashiach. There's the communication laid out for us. But I say, oh, it's not just there's the Mashiach. Proof that it's Yahusha. He's the guy. So I can I can feel comfortable, comfortable and confident that if the Jews say, forget him, he's an idiot, he's a punk, he's a he's a no good. No, that's him. So now I don't listen to the Jews because they're denying him. But if the Christians say, hey, he he saved us from the law, we don't have to do anything that the uh, old God of the Old Testament told us to do. It's like, wait a minute. I can see this Mishkan pattern. Het Tet Yod is the big white fence. Kaf Lam at the barbecue girl. Mil, Mem Noon the laver. Samak the menorah. I in the table of showbread. Pay the altar of incense. And Zadi the Ark of the Covenant. Kuf the pillar of fire and smoke. It's like, where do you get that? That's part of the study. It's written up in the Shields Project. You can read it on erictology.net. But that's what it's correlated to being the Moedim. So as I started talking an hour ago about this Moedim, the Moedim, if this is accurate, that between the letters Het and Zadi are the Moedim, and the Zadi being the seventh one is an equation to the Shabbat, even though it's also lined up with Shemini Yatzeret, the Zion is the seventh letter, so it lines up with Shabbat, the seventh day. So I can see this pattern, and what do you know? There's these two things which are weapons, which are like, yeah, the Zion, the crucifixion, and the Zadi, the resurrection, and they both correlate to the Sabbath day. When I saw that back in like 2005, I realized, wow, this Sabbath day is really important. More Sab more important than anything I had ever even guessed or was told to believe as a doctrine or, hey, this is really important. Look, it's written right here in scripture. It's like, yeah, yeah. But when I saw that, wait a minute, the two letters that are weapons, the two letters which are men is the Vav and the Resh, but the two letters of weaponry is the Zion and the Zadi. Something important, especially if you want to do spiritual warfare. It's like, do you have any credibility control over the demons if they exist? And it's like, well, if you're not keeping the Sabbath day, maybe you got nothing. Well, maybe you got your intent. Well, your intent. So you see pictures on the internet about people casting out demons, and I've been at places and seen people cast out demons if they're really there, and I know people that say they are, and I know people that say they aren't. But the point is, what what projection does your own mind throw into the mix? No, I'm just reading. I'm just believing. No, wait a minute. Remember we talked about that lady last week called Veda Austin. Maybe, maybe that was in the after show. V-E-D-A. A-U-S-T-I-N, Veda Austin. She's a lady from New Zealand who's done a study with water. I don't know what she believes religiously or spiritually. I can't validate or invalidate her, but I'm saying this, that she found that you can think, have a bowl of water, you put the water in the freezer, sometimes only like three seconds or 30 seconds or a minute, different, different experiments. And when she pulled it out, the water would take on a frozen structure that looks like the thing she was thinking about. That's water just being frozen. Okay, similar to Dr. Emoto's work, but similar but different. But if there's any credibility that you can project into something like water, your thoughts, and have it give a structural reference pictographically, if, if this lady, Veda Austin, is onto something, and we're composed of more then 95%, some say 99%, if you look at how much is actually H2O water molecules within the human body, then it's like, if we think about Yahoo's stuff, we become what we're thinking about. We're projecting onto ourselves that water. That as water, every water molecule, as we think about Yahoo's stuff, we become that. And if we think about other stuff, scary movies, demonic whatever you know portals opening up and nephilim jumping out and running around around the earth you know stuff like was supposed to happen tomorrow you know if we think about that then that's what we're going to manifest if we think about whatsoever is pure and clean and of good report and what whatsoever is of yahuwah's personal intent somehow we wear that we become that and and, and then it affects our thoughts to generate other thoughts. Like there's a generational linkage. And so going back to that treasure map, 
it's like, okay, what do all these pictures mean? Why all these things? And I could say, well, there might be a hundred ways to read the alphabet. There might be 10,000 ways to read the alphabet. One of the ways is certainly the fractal role of Yahusha. One of them is to look at the Sabbath day in the Moedim. One of them I could say, well, if it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with Elohim and the word was Elohim, then I could determine looking at the 22 letters and saying somehow it describes Elohim. And because it has that, it holds the seven Moedim and the Shabbat, then somehow I have to realize Yahuwah's of both, the Elohim of Israel, has his witness in the alphabet because his witness is in the Moedim. And because the Moedim is in the alphabet, it validates this entire study of the alphabet as being him. And if Yahusha is a word made flesh, then that means Yahusha's identity is wrapped up in the Moedim. And if you don't regard the Moedim, you got the wrong Messiah. You got the Antichrist, as a matter of fact. If your JC, if your Jesus Christ doesn't validate, embody, portray the Moedim of Yahweh's Avot, it's the Antichrist. There, I said it again. Yahusha, the true Mashiach of Israel, the sent one from Yahuwah's Avot, as his word made flesh to dwell among us and point us back to his majesty and glory, his kavod, is the Moedim, which according to Leviticus 23 includes the Yom HaShabbat, the Sabbath day. And therefore, any church who thinks that the Sabbath day, the seventh day Sabbath and the Moedim of Leviticus 23 are not their own. Anyone who thinks, oh, that's Jewish crap. That's 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 Jewish paganry. They're antichrist, just so you know. They're they're contrary to the Mashiach communication that Yahweh gave his people. And when so then when Yahuwah says, the seventh day Sabbath is the sign that I'm your Elohim and you're my people. It's the indicator of a relationship. It bears witness. The Sabbath day is the thing that gives testimony that you're mine and I'm yours. So anybody that gets up and says, give your testimony that you're a believer so you know for sure that your sins are given and you're going to heaven. It's like, he didn't say that. What he said is you keep the Sabbath day. So if that's Old Testament and the New Testament says you don't have to keep the Sabbath day, that's some law. Don't let any man put that monkey on your back. You just give testimony that you ask Jesus into your heart. It's like, where's the verse that says to ask Jesus in your heart? Not there. The closest one is Yeshua says in book of Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open that I'll come in. But he never said to get saved, you have to ask me into your heart. That's that's extrapolated. I'm just saying there's there's big problems going on. So if I'm going to say, well, listen, here, let me let me talk about another way to read the treasure map. So we're talking about quite a bit, Jeremiah 31, where Ephraim, who Yahweh says, Ephraim is my firstborn, my bet, cough, rash, my bakar. He's, he also said Israel was his firstborn son, but now he says Ephraim is his firstborn, though Ephraim was the secondborn of Joseph, not even, not even of Jacob, of Israel. But yet Jacob said, I'm going to take Joseph, I'm going to take your two sons as if they were my own. So yeah, there's the 12 tribes. But instead of Joseph, he's taken Ephraim and Manasseh. So there's actually technically 13 tribes. Because they were each of, on their own recognizance. And you could say, well, what does Ephraim mean? Well, it means to be fruitful. What does Manasseh mean? It means I forget. I forget the torments of my past. And it's like, well, OK, but how does that fit into the other 12? If you got 12 constellations, you got 12 stones on the breastplate. One of them was supposed to be Joseph, but if you replace it with Ephraim and Manasseh, what does that mean? Is one of them in half? Is schizophrenic sort of a, maybe there's there's other things. I'm not putting schizophrenia down. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it a validity, actually, that, that there's something about it, like bipolar is not, you could say, well, that's a terrible thing. It's like, well, there might be something more to it than we know, but it's a, it's a human condition. But what I'm saying is, why are we talking about Ephraim? Because Jeremiah 31 says it's about Ephraim, Ephraim coming back. Well, so what about Ephraim coming back? Well, Ephraim was the principal, the lead head tribe of the northern kingdom. The lost 10 tribes, prince is Ephraim. 
Yeah, but where are they? Well, they still haven't come back. And some people say that if they ever come back, they're automatically absorbed into the concept of being a Jew. Well, no, that's not what he said. As a matter of fact, if you look real close, there's two places in the scripture where the prophecy was given to the 12 tribes, each of the patriarchs of the tribes. One was in Genesis 49, and that's where Moshe, at his death, he said, here's a prophecy concerning Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah. The, Judah was the fourth, fourth born. Reuben was the first, and he ends up going through and talking about Joseph in verse 26. That's a whole nother study, but this is what he said in my translation of Genesis 49, 26. So has this happened yet? If, remember, Joseph, a lot of people, I gotta say, remember, a lot of people have never read this story. So there was 12 sons of Joseph, or of Jacob. Jacob uh, really favored the one son, Joseph, because he had two wives and a couple other concubine wives, uh, para wives, you might say. But uh, Joseph was the firstborn of his, truly his beloved wife. And then Benjamin was born and she died in childbirth with Benjamin. But the concept of Jeremiah 31, that Rachel is weeping for her children. Which children? Joseph and Benjamin? She wasn't even around for Benjamin. So Jeremiah 31 is a strange chapter. You have to read into that. But the point is, Ephraim was the son of Joseph. But when, so when Moshe gives this parable about Joseph, is he talking about Ephraim and Manasseh? He didn't give a parable about Ephraim and Manasseh. He gave a parable about Joseph. So when he talks about Joseph, it talks about the northern kingdom of the last 10 tribes somehow as him being the principal chief. And so this is what he said. The blessing I desire for you, the blessing I desire for you as your father is to amplify the same blessing I received from my father, to magnify the family bequeathment, which is trusteeship of Iandaliting Aleph Tav generation after generation, filling the world. May it happen upon the head of Yosef, exist as his headship that he would accumulate ultimately at the end of it all, because his head was pushed down by his brothers, they will put the crown upon his bowed head. That happened yet? If the 10 tribes are still lost, it hasn't happened yet. And if everybody says, well, if you come back to the Torah, you're automatically a Jew, then it hasn't happened yet. And if the Jews run the land of Israel and they won't let anybody in unless you're a Jew, you claim that your mother and your grandmother were Jews and you got to deny Yeshua, then it hasn't happened yet. So this can't be the end of the world because that prophecy hasn't happened. Then if you look in Deuteronomy 33, that, that's where the first one was not Moshe, excuse me. That was where Jacob was uh, dying. Those are his last words. Now, this one was with Moshe. Deuteronomy 33, verse 17 is the principal verse talking about it. And this is my translation of what he said. The firstborn status of rulership has been held in abeyance, hiatus, on hold. He will, speaking of Joseph, he will gain access to it when he values it more than anything else, when he rejoices in it as the ultimate treasure. Bejeweled by literacy, when he gets it, he will burst forth with enlightenment, pays audio, the open mouth, the open language, literacy. He will burst forth with enlightenment, contending with any adversary of this one matter, as nothing else matters. The family, those of the heritage, will multiply by 10,000, a thousand times more fruitful enriched beyond any previous custodianship. The era of Yosef's reign will cause all previous frustrations and failing to fade away, forgotten unto oblivion. That's the word Manasseh. The one multiplied by 10,000, a thousand times more fruitful is the word Ephraim. Well, that hasn't happened yet. As a matter of fact, it looks like we're still at the place where that should happen. Well, then it, 
if it hasn't happened and it should happen, then where are we? And I mentioned, I heard it again from somebody else that says, listen, you know, if we look at past history, we're expecting the second coming, the return of Yahusha, Kufing on back down here. We're expecting the thousand years of his reign. But guess what? That already happened. But it was erased from our consciousness. That is the Tartarian Empire. What? Huh? What? Tartarian who? So there's people who are saying, we've been lied to about history, about the, the calendar. And that these folks called the Tartarians were the thousand years of Revelation 1920, where the devil was bound for a thousand years and they thrived and had wonderful times. And then the devil got loose. And that's where we are right now. That's what other people are saying. It's like, as I said last week, I have no idea where we are. <laughs> I was told, you live in America. Really? Well, I've been in an airplane flying across the land and I, I can see that. But if somebody says, yes, this is the year 2024, I don't, I don't know that that's true. That's just somebody else's reckoning. Are we expecting the return of Yeshua in front of us? Is it going to happen after April 8th? It was supposed to happen last Yom Teru. It uh, didn't happen. What about the one before that? Well, some people were saying it was going to happen. We don't even know. And it's like, how do I know it happened in the past or didn't happen in the past? I don't know. What if we are now at the end of the thousand years instead of the beginning of the thousand years. I don't know. But it doesn't change who I am and what we're supposed to be doing. We're simply supposed to be doing what he said. Yahweh is my Elohim. But if I'm going to sit here and say, what has got this got to do with Ephraim? Well, look at Jeremiah 31. It says Ephraim, the translation of Stone Snox says, after my rebellion or after my regretting i repent it's like the word shin bet we talked about this before it can mean to sit to dwell it's the word shabbat it can also mean rebel repent and return it all that is shin bet or shin va bet or teshuva so if i said if i could say well wait a minute yahweh said in jeremiah 31 he said once ephraim came back to his senses and said, bring me back and I will come back. Has Ephraim come back yet? Not that I can see, unless he came back over a thousand years ago and now we're at the tail end of that whole thing. But still, I'm at the place where come back to what? Deuteronomy 30. Moshe says, this is one of the last things Moshe said, Deuteronomy chapter 30. When all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse, as I've told you today, then you will return to these words with all your heart and all your soul. And then I'm going to pour out the trouble that you guys were getting. I'm going to pour it on your enemies, those who hounded you for all those years. And then there's that 2,730-year curse thing. And it's like, well, if that's now, and it's like, I don't know if it's now, because I don't know what year this is. We think it's 2024, but if there's another 1,000 years, I don't know. But, but from at least the reckoning they've handed us, 721 BC was when the Assyrians took over the northern kingdom. And 2,730 years, which is seven times 390, as per Ezekiel 4, brings you to 2010, which was 14 years ago now. At least there's that. If we don't know anything else, at least there's that. And even if that's not the true reckoning, at least it looks like it is. So that's all I have to go by. And if I can say, okay, well then, then this is time for Ephraim to wake up and come back because the prison door is open. The Pezadi, hey, there's a model Pezadi, Yeshua coming out of the grave. Blossoms coming out of the mouth, springtime refreshing the earth with sprouts and flowers. It's all the same picture as Ephraim coming back to his sanity and coming back to the terms of the covenant. So that's the fractal model right there. Well, then if I could read this treasure map as if it was a message to Ephraim, what would that look like? So if I could say, okay, the idea of a bow and arrow is the guy has to have intent. That's why he makes the bow and arrow. So it, it speaks of the archer who wants to hit a certain target. He, and then he has to make his arrows with fletchings to fly straight. So fletchings, to make something fly fly straight, true, correct, is kufshin tet, which is also the word for bow. So the concept of a picture with bow and arrows is there's a truth. What's the truth? Well, we just talked about and validated that the truth could be found in the Hebrew alphabet. So there's something about 
coming to the awareness of the real meaning of the Hebrew alphabet because it's correlated to the identity of Yeshua and that the letters find their bearing in the Mishkan pattern, which is the Moedim of Leviticus 23, which co corresponds to the seven days of creation and the articles of the Mishkan in Exodus 25. So that's like the triangulation of validation, quadrangulation, if you had the Beatitudes of Matthew 5. So you got the seven days of creation, the Mishkan, the, the, the tabernacle of Exodus 25 and thereafter, the Moedim of Leviticus 23, the Beatitudes of Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 5, and all those give structure to the Mishkan pattern in the first seven letters. So you've got two sets of seven, the first seven, then the next 11, which is a group of seven. It's kind of like seven seals and then seven trumpets, book of Revelation, something like that. Then the last four letters, just saying there's a pattern like tooth on a key. But that means that there's hidden cryptic knowledge. So you got this picture on the treasure map of a frog. The word frog is Zafarda, Ziffer. Zadi Pei Resh is a, a songbird, a Tweety bird in the morning. <whistles> What's he saying? Oh, he's just saying no. No, no. Uh, it's a it's a cryptic message. And Dalit Ayan is the word knowledge. And a tadpole is a called a Rashon, one with a big head or a, a great beginning like Mount Sinai. Hey, Abraham taking the uh, slaves out of Egypt and giving them freedom as Yahoo's people. What a great beginning. Yeah, like that. So the hidden encrypted knowledge is the, the frog and the tadpole. And then it's all about no matter what happens to you ever, no matter how long, even if you lose track of the calendar and your identity, you can always come back if you teshuva. Ephraim, you wake up, you want to come home? Teshuva. Come back to these words I tell you today. Deuteronomy 30. So that's the pig. The word pig is chazir chetzai and yod resh, which means one who returns, like the boomerang. One who returns, you're kicked out, come on back. Yahweh kicked you out because you, he told you not to play baseball too close to the house, and you did. Your friends broke the window, and so somebody's going to get in big trouble. But you can always repent and come back. Find favor. Repent and find favor? Chet tet yod. I sinned, I incurred guilt. I have a sin sacrifice who takes my sin for me so that I can be washed clean and I can find favor. That's what the word chet tet yod means. Those three letters happens to line up with the day of Passover, Pesach, that first festival, the big white fence, just like Yeshua being put into the grave, the first day of unleavened bread, where he said, don't eat leavening of, don't eat leavened bread for a week. He told us to go on that fast of what not to eat and then said, this is the sign you're my people if you listen to my words and won't eat leavened bread for a week. He didn't say anything about giving up something for Lent. He said, don't eat leavened bread for a week. That's a sign that you're my people. And for those of us who are misled, he says, I'm going to send one to retrieve you. That's Yeshua. That's the well. The bucket dropped down to bring the water up to the surface. That's the meaning of the word Dalal, which is in Dalit, which is door, which is Yeshua claiming I'm be the door to bring you back to the house of my father. It's a, these, these pictures. And then he says, you know, I told you all along, we wouldn't have any of this trouble if you would have just grabbed a hold of my moosey. My moose? Grabbed a hold of my moose? My fortress, my my promise. It's the word mauz, memvav. Remember Ayn Vav Zion, like Oz, Ayn Zion. If you would have just believed me and grabbed a hold of what I gave you, you, you wouldn't have been in this trouble. You wouldn't, but now that now that you are in this trouble, just grab a hold. Come back to these words and grab a hold, and you'll be rescued. Hey, Vav. Here's the key. The reason to use it, the reason to reject it. See, he doesn't just say, here it is. He, he'll, he'll also give us an easy excuse why we could just not listen to him. It's, it's kind of troublesome. You know, it's kind of like you were saying, hey, you guys like the, uh, the fish and the loaves and the bread that I give you and healing your kids. Hey, why don't you drink my blood and eat my flesh? Hey, you're sick, man. We're out of here. And everybody left. And then he said to the disciples, hey, why don't you guys leave too? And they said, where are we going to go? Who else has words of life? Okay, but see, he pushes people away. He he both attracts them and he pushes them away. There's something about the dynamic of both things going on. 
that's part of his character. That's kind of like, here's the key to rescue, but, but it's it's on a, it's nailed to a stake in the tar pit and the sign says, stay away. That, that's the picture. And then the, what's this thing with the weapon adorned with weapons, this whip, identification authenticated. The word sheen resh bet tet means rebate because something's discounted. That's the word to scribble. It means to be flogged. His back looks like it's all scribbled, and it also means scepter. There's something about his scepter. See, it's all hidden in words. If you, there's a few clue words, but then there's other words in the dictionary that weren't put on there. But you, if you find them, you go, wait a minute. To be adorned with weapons is his scepter? It's like the crown of thorns. To be whipped by the scepter. It's like, wait a minute. You see, that's more proof of who that guy was. And so people who say, quit talking about him. He's no Messiah. It's like, well, he certainly was. He certainly is. That story of what he was and is and evermore shall be is all, it, the more you look at the words, the more it's theirs, at least as far as I can see. But yet see, Ephraim, because of the uh, Leviticus 26, keyed with uh, Ezekiel 4, was told he was locked down seven times, 390. So there's this fence of, Chet, in this case, a prison of Ephraim. You're going to be locked out of access to this stuff, and you're going to be blind and ignorant and oppressed by your enemies for 2,730 years. So world history looks like the northern kingdom, the tribes of Ephraim, the Joseph's family, and his the heritage of him being king you're king of the gutter, man. You're king of the of the dump. Oh, no, that's not what it's supposed to be. Well, we haven't seen that yet, unless that was Tartaria. But the point is, seven times, there's the there's the lock, the combo, the, the, the combo lock, the, the tet. And when you come back, you, you're going to have to put your effort. It's not going to be handed to you on a silver platter, like apples of gold on a platter of silver. Talk about Proverbs of the words. You're going to have to dig for this. So that picture of the excavators, the yod, that be ashamed. Chet, pay, resh, chafar. Be ashamed, dig, search, pioneer. It's all the same word. Cough, learn to read, navigate the instructions. The helm. Lamed, search for what I said I desired. Walk the walk. So I think it's the word is bakash uh, chafatsi. Yahweh said, you want to come back home, Ephraim? Make road markers for yourself. The path, conduct your heart on the path that should be walking, and you find out what I said I wanted. Well, we know what he wants. He wants us to go to church and sing songs and give him 10% of our offering. And trust that the blood of Jesus forgives us for all the other stupid stuff we do. No, that's not what he said. In fact, he didn't say give 10% of your the tithe of your income for an offering. He said store up 10% and spend it on whatever your heart desires for Sukkot. And, and help all the, all those other people that don't have any money give stuff to them at Sukkot. That's what he said. Yeah, I don't hear that preach ever. I don't, I don't think I ever did in church. But the point is, what did he say he wants us to do? He, taught, he wanted us to quit working on Shabbat and to keep the Moedim because they testify of his grandeur somehow by keeping these Moedim of Leviticus 23. It is his identity proclaimed on the face of the earth. Not Christmas and Easter, not Sunday. The Moedim. That's what he said. And then your inner self, your, your womb of my seed, is what he said. Within you, the parable of the sowers zealously craving to be pregnant with his word. There's Mem. Noon. There's a picture of a, a scorpion there. The word scorpion Ayan Kuf, I think it was Ayan Kuf and uh, Peresh Zadi, Peresh Yodai, Ayan Kuf Bet. I don't have it written down here anyway, but the whole, the whole idea is he's going to allow there to be great opposition. It's not just a, a holiday and a free sailed right into the promised land. We, we're going to have to contend against Ayan Kuf is the word for trouble or distress, hence the word for scorpion. And the word for pirates is Peresh Yodzadi. He called those things in to his people. And he says, uh, there's this word, Nun Gimel Chet, push, thrust, gore. It's like gladiator death sport. The word for Zachak Adon, the smile Adon, the prescribed por portion is Chet Kuf that we're supposed to imitate. So the whole thing with the smile Adon, the uh, 
saber tooth tiger little uh, graphic was to say, this is what Joseph is called to. Thrown into this the gladiator ring. It's a death sport. Joseph, you want to come back to the covenant and take over the headship? You're going to have to show everybody else how it's done. And if you uh, fail, you're, you die. You're, you're, you're a dead man, so you better prevail. When he was thrown into the pit with the uh, snakes and scorpions, only they didn't kill him. So his brothers said, well, that's not working. So they pulled him out and sold him to the uh, Ishmaelites who were taking him into slavery in Egypt. Somehow he's going to provide on this path these scorpions and that we have to be thankful for and prevail through. That's part of the journey. It brings Yosef to his destiny. Samak, Migdal Or, Lighthouse, Shamar the Task, your engagement, your weapon. Give me a weapon. <laughs> your weapon is the Sabbath day. Oh, your uh, your prophets and popes and bishops and pastors and professors took it from you and told you that the uh, to honor his resurrection will make the first day the holy day instead of the seventh and make it a criminal federal felony crime in the Roman Empire to rest on the seventh day. Well, they were making it clear that they're not his people and that they're not his covenant, the his being Yahweh's vote, the Elohim of Israel. They were making it really clear, and we don't even know. We don't even seem to get it because, oh, we're his, we're the bride of Christ, aren't we? That's what they told us. By being the bride of Christ, you now lose the identifying trademark of the Sabbath day, and you think you're still his beloved? They got you thinking that, didn't they? Because the thinking is that ion, it's all about mishfat, a man's way returned on his own head, hence the teeter-totter. And it's like, when Yahweh says to do something you don't, you're in trouble. If he says to do something you do it, then you succeed. That's the way it works. Mishfat is the foundation of his throne, which is symbolized by the teeter-totter. And then after the 2730 years, after all this time, finally it opens up. The padlock is open. That's the pay and a waterfall coming out. But then for Ephraim to be able to crawl out, to spread his wings, I and pay, pay, zadi, zadi, kuf, kuf, resh, resh, sheen. Are you ready to behave, Ephraim? Are you ready to come back to the covenant? Or are you going to keep, keep wallowing in your pig slime? It ain't going to work if you do. So to in emerge as a butterfly is the zadi picture whereas the caterpillar going into the cocoon is the vav going into the het so there's this butterfly view compared to the caterpillar view that's the zadi so the kuf like the word mushroom pay tet resh yod hey is to open to set free to escape acquitted redeemed concluded well, it's the firstborn, the one, the firstborn who opens the womb is also considered not only Betkov Resh or Betkov Vav Resh, but it's Pe Tet Resh Yod Hey, which is the same word as mushroom. So this is about Ephraim saying, well, this is about Yosef then. Are you ready for, to take the crown on your head? Are you ready to lead the family in the way it ought to be? And whether or not that was the Tartarian Empire, it's what's in front of us to simply do what he said. And whatever time this is, well, now that's up to him. It doesn't really matter. But the idea that word uh, sheen mem resh kuf ayan is the word mushroom, but also means domed, which is a firmament expanse. It's a projector screen, flat and spread out. And it's like, is that the reign of Yosef coming back, or is that just a model of the flat earth and the dome? I don't know what it is, but it's just interesting. It has to do with the mushroom. And it, it resh, hey, resh, the pinnacle, and you could say, welcome back, Ephraim. Jeremiah 31. And Sheen, there's a picture of a shark there. Well, the word shark is kaf, resh, yod, sheen. If you read that in English backwards, it's shirk. So the word shark, interesting, is the Hebrew word read left to right instead of right to left. It's also the word for belly. It's also the word for poverty or in want, which is to like to say you can't end the craving. It's constantly wanting to feed and eat and devour. It's this constant pursuit. So you could say that the concept of constant craving. 
And we're told that Abba has been constantly craving to see this happen, Ephraim coming home and to restore the, the kingship, as it were, on Yosef's head. It was prophesied by Yaakov. It's prophesied by Moshe. It's prophesied by these Aleph Bet letters. It's prophesied in Jeremiah 31. When's it going to happen? Well, when we come back to do what he said with all our heart and all our soul, that's when it's going to happen. So the word ab is the same as aviv, which is springtime, which is verter, which is to want, willing, wish, refuse energetically. It's aleph bet hey. It's aleph bet bet. Bet bet is a gateway or an entrance. So this craving desire to say, let's see his kingdom manifest. But see, it was typified by Yeshua's narrative, the gospel narrative story lined up with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. But I'm just reading this 22 letters as if it was a message to Ephraim. So Abba and the entire universe, all the host of angels have been waiting for the revealing of the sons of Elohim. Does that just mean when we die and the new heaven and new earth? Or is that like right now to restore the family head? And then the Tav, like the exit at the end, this goal achieved is just the beginning of what it could have, would have, should have been Ever since Moshe, back in um, 3,500 years ago. So there's an interesting thing. If you flip back, ju jumping here to um, Jeremiah 24, pull that one out of the blue. <laughs> if you say, well, Jeremiah 31, that's where we're looking about Ephraim, and it backs up to Jeremiah 30. Well, then to get the context back up, 29, 20, go back to Jeremiah 24. And it starts off with a certain subject. And if you look at it in the definition uh, or the defined translation, it says, hey, Jeremiah, what do you see? Oh, I see a couple baskets of figs. Hey, very good. What about them baskets of figs? Well, one's so good that it's uh, it's wonderfully good, delicious. And the other one is so bad, they, they can't be eaten. They're just foul and rotten. And he says, well, even so. And then uh, Yahuwah uses this as a parable. Well, in Jeremiah 1, he says, hey, what do you see? And he says, I see an almond branch. And, and Yahuwah says, even so, very good, good job identifying what you're looking at. Even so, I'm industrious and diligent about all my stuff. It's like, what's that got to do with an almond? Because the word shakad, shinkuf dal, it literally is the word almond, but it also is the word industrious and diligent. Okay. Kufresh nun is the word horn, but nun is a suffix, and kufresh aleph means learn to read. Yod kufresh means precious, dear, costly, rare, to be increased in value, like, oh, I didn't even know what this was, and now all of a sudden I see, what, what is this? So I can see the word horn as meaning not just horn, but radiant splendor, privilege, Something that you're you got a great reputation for, like if you have, if your country has a great economy, a great military, a great history of invention of technology, those are all horns. But to learn how to read is the ultimate horn of literacy for any person. That's that's the way the Hebrew language works. So here, if I if I look at the English, I'm going to spin off onto something else. So I'm going to look at Jeremiah 24 here. We're going to go through the first verse. It's a long verse. We're going to go through the first verse, then we're going to jump up to the seventh verse. Look at this here. Hey, resh, aleph, nun, yod. Well, nun, yod is a suffix, means something caused me to be able to do the verb action. Well, the verb action, hey is the, but resh, aleph. Resh Aleph isn't even a word. Resh Aleph, hey, means to see. So I have to know the way the structure of the Hebrew language is, is that if I have Aleph is a suffix, it's kind of an Aramaic thing, but if hey is a suffix, I can remove it and stick other suffixes on, and it doesn't change it from being that verb, root, as it's called. I, I can put a, like a tav yod instead of a hey, or, but, or a vav instead of a hey. But, so Resh Aleph, hey, means to put on an exhibition or cause to say. To cause to see something because it's been exhibited and I've been given the perception. So this word is translated that Yahweh caused me to see because the second word is Yahweh. So here in, e in Hebrew, what you have is the verb and then the one causing the verb as the second. And, you know, like in English, we say white house. In Spanish, you say Casa Blanca, which is house white. So Hebrew, like Spanish, they flip things around. So if you're doing translation, you got to 
figure out what comes first or what what's the subject, what's the predicate, what follows what. But I'm also finding that almost doesn't matter. Because you can read the sentences forward and backwards, you can read a word by letter spelling frontwards and backwards, or you can look at the two outside letters, look what's in between. There's all different things you can do to words. So don't think that just because you're literate, you don't know how to read. You, you, because you're illiterate, you'll be able to read better than someone who learned proper grammar, just so you know. But anyway, this is to say, Yahweh has caused me to see something that he put on exhibition, and behold, which is Vav, Hey Nun Hey, and Hannah, Sheni, that's the word two, she Nun Yod, the word shinun yod is not just the number two, it's also the color red, and it means different or variant, like teeth opposing each other, or teeth lining up different this way and lining up different this way. And then the word is dalit vav dalit alef yod. Duda e, duda, duda, like <laughs> duda, duda. It's like, what's that? Well, the word dude or David is my beloved, right? So this is like two lovers. Like that song, Torn Between Two Lovers, you know, feeling like a fool. It's like, wait a minute, Yahweh showed me two lovers? And then here's this word, Tav, Aleph, Nun, Yod, Mem. Well, Yod, Mem is the plural, but Nun, Yod, Mem is a word that means sleep. And if it's Tav, Aleph, Tav is the prefix letter that means it's not present tense. So it's I will or I have. I've been asleep or I will go to sleep because the Aleph means I. So Tav, Aleph, does that mean uh, I, I'm, I'm going to sleep? But Tav, the first letter, and Mem, the perf last letter is perfect. The letter in the middle is Noon, which jumps out. What, what jumps out of, of a perfection of Aleph Yod? And Aleph Yod means uh, where? It's an island. It's like, where am I? I've been asleep. Well, it's almost like after him waking up and say, what's going on here? But Tav Aleph Noon is the word that means fig. So you'll see in the English definition, if you read this, it's like he was shown two baskets of figs. But the word fig is also the word for excuse. It's a cause or a pretext for a mishap. Well, when was figs ever having anything to do with excuses where there was a cause or a pretext for a mishap? The Garden of Eden with Adam and Hua. <laughs> they were told, don't eat this tree. They ate the tree. That was the problem. Why did he even put the tree there? Because it was the setup for a conflict. Yahuwah put the tree in the garden just so if there was going to be a problem, it's going to be about that tree. If there was going to be a conflict of obedience and non-obedience, it's all about this tree and eating the fruit. It wasn't any one of 10 other laws. It was this one law. So Yahweh staged the entire problem with humanity with this one matter. Don't eat this. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Let's eat it. <laughs> what? What? Where'd you get that idea? Well, somebody said that you were kidding around, that you lied, that you were holding something back, that you you didn't really mean it. I mean, somebody somebody dressed up real shiny and ooh, interesting looking. That's what the word nachash means. It means serpent, but it also means copper and or bronze, and it means enchanting or shiny or ooh, kind of mesmerizing, glittery, and that it's all the same word. And be, when they ate the tree, gosh, what do we do? Well, they felt embarrassed physically, so they got fig leaves and, and covered their, their genitalia with fig leaves. Why? Because there's something about the word tav alef nun that also means weep, lament, cause excuse, and accident. And it also means the right time has come, meaning when it's spring or the rut season of animals and they stop getting interested in a, in a sexual encounter with the other gender. So that's where people come up with this idea that Eve got impregnated by both the snake and Adam at that occasion. It's like, where do you come up with stuff like that? You know, the, the, the demon spawn, the evil seed, it comes from the fact that it's in Tav Aleph Noon, the word for fig. And it's the word for um, the serpent. It says in, I think it was Genesis 2, that it was more 
wise and clever and sneaky. But that word wise, clever, and sneaky is the same. I think it's Ayn Rash Mem is the same exact word as naked. It said Adam and Eve were naked, and not ashamed, but that word naked is the same exact word as wise, clever, and sneaky that the that the serpent had. And it's like, what's one got to do with the other? It, that's just it's in the language. But this fact that there's a fig about an excuse about an accident. Oops, look what we did. We ate the tree. We didn't do it on purpose. Well, we kind of did, but that was an accident. And so now we're ashamed. And it's, why was it that time? What's that got to do with the right time? Well, the word Moedim means appointed time. So it has something to do with a an appointed time that everything was staged and set up. And guess what? The next word in this sentence is the word Moedim. Well, if you read the English translation, it says, Two baskets of figs were prepared. But what it really says, be, be, be fared and put in front of uh, the temple of Yahweh or something. But if you read this in Hebrew, it says, Yahweh caused me to see on exhibition and to understand, behold, two different lovers that I've been asleep. It wasn't my, my fault. I, I've got an excuse for this accident, this mishap that happened regarding the Moedim. What accident has happened regarding the Moedim? It goes on to say, Lifne Hayakal, or in the presence of the temple, or the, but see, Yod Kaf Lamed, as I said a few minutes ago, means to have the power and capacity to prevail and contain it all. In Lifne, Pei Nun is in the face of, but it also means according to my kind. Pei Nun is kind, type, or sort. Or you could say, as my face approves of. Because you could say, like the great ironic benediction, Al Peneka, in his face, may his face shine upon you. But that word face means in his presence, in his regard, that he will turn his face to look at you, or according to the type, because Pei Nun is type. But it can also mean to turn away from, to vacate. I'm, I'm not going to have anything more to do to you, do with you because now I'm on leave, I'm on vacation, and I'm turning away. So you could say this word leaf name means in the presence of, or that his face has approved of, or his face has not approved of. It's the Moedim. The Moedim he either approves of, if it's written in Leviticus 23, or he disapproves of, like if we amalgamate pagan rituals like Sunday, the day, venerable day of the sun, thank you, St. Constantine, for making that clear, and Christmas and Easter, Ishtar, the fertility goddess of the Canaanites. Yeah. So is this the fact that there are two different types of lovers that he has? One says, we love you very much, but we're going to keep the fa pagan festivals? Because, after all, they're yours. It, it is according to your face. It's lifne hayakal yahua achri. The word achri achar means future, strange, other, next, different, delayed, late in arriving. Like two thousand years, fifteen hundred, two thousand years after Abraham, fifteen hundred years after he said to Moshe, "Don't have any Elohim achrim. Don't have any gods of others." The word achar literally means delayed in arriving, coming later. And so 1,500 years after he gave Deuteronomy, Yeshua shows up, born on Christmas and resurrecting on Easter. No, that's not what he did. No, that's what we're told he did. It's a char. It's other, strange, future, different, delayed, late in arriving. And only the galut Himmel Lamed, exiled, uncovered. Here you're covered, you're in a city, you're in a refuge. Your enemy comes in, tears apart your city, takes you into slavery, so you're now Gimel Lamed. But Gimel Lamed is also a revolving door. Gimel Lamed, Vav Tav, Vav Tav is the plural. I'm, Yod Mem is, Im is the uh, feminine, uh, masculine plural, and Ut is the feminine plural suffix, just so you know. So the Galut is where we get the word Kelt, C, in English, the, the, the Celt, the letter C is the third letter, like the letter Gimel. So the Galut are the Celts. In other words, the ones that were taken into exile by the Assyrians ran through the Caucasus Mountains, from what I understand, that why they're called Caucasians. Others went south, you know, the, the black tribes of uh, Africa. That's a whole other question of history that I'm not going to get into, but it's like 
you know, were the were the original Israelites um, red or were they black or were they white or it's like whatever. That that's a whole other thing. But what I'm just saying that's where the word Caucasian comes from. The northern ten tribes get sucked into the area of Turkey and uh, Ir northern Iraq, which was where Assyria, which is where Nineveh was, the capital of Assyria. And then they then they flee through the Caucasus Mountains up into the area of Ukraine and then into Europe, get known as the Celts. Just showing you the connection there. And then here's this word. So that, so reading this verse, it says, he showed me there's these two lovers that have excuses. They were asleep regarding the Moedim. They were lied to, you might say. And uh, they, they they all thought it was the the, the, the temple of Yahweh, the palace of his, his prestige, even though it was different. But we're, we're galoots. That's the excuse. And then here's this word, noon, bet, vav, kof, dalit, resh, aleph, zadi, resh. Whoa, huge word. But I could look at say, okay, listen, whoa. start start at the end of the word and back up and just look what's in this word. Aleph, zadi, resh, atzer means to store up and accumulate. Zadi, resh is rock. I will accumulate. Well, that's like Joseph. Joseph, the word Yosef means I will accumulate. Threshold, goblet, sofa, yosuf, samic pay, the same as the Azor Islands. It's, it's like this fortress out in the middle of the Atlantic where it's like a treasure house. Dalit resh aleph is a, is a, means aversion or shame. Kof dalit resh, round like a ball. Bet vav kof, confused or perplexed. And then nun bet, the word for nav, navi, which is like the prophet, Noon bet kof, this is noon bet vav kof, is a hiding place, a source or a spring. There's that movie, Manon of the Spring, Jean de Flore, that I've mentioned, French movie, English subtitles, where Manon finds the source of water for this town that has caused a lot of trouble, and she plugs it up with these with, with these rocks, and they go, what's going on? Is it some sign from, from some uh, god that uh, we don't have any water? And they start look, soul searching and all this stuff, and it's like, well, that sounds like this. They're saying, why is there no water? We better search our soul and find out, has anybody sinned? Well, that's the same picture of man of the spring is that word right here at verse one of Jeremiah 24. It's pronounced Nebuchadrezzar. It's not Nebuchadnezzar. It's, it, it might be his grandson or something. It's Nebuchadrezzar, or that, that was maybe a different way of pronouncing his name. But the point is what it means is, why is there no water? What's going on? Like we could look at it and say, Where's your God? Why is Christians chopped up in Nigeria by Islam? Doesn't that mean Islam is true? If the Catholic was right by saying, we know we're right because we won, then you could say, well, Islamic guys are saying, we know we're right because we prevail against chopping up the Christians with machetes and light their houses on fire and they can't stop us. Ha <laughs> ha! Where's your God? Why is there no water? Why doesn't he put the fire out? That's what that word is saying. And then all of a sudden you get the word Melech Babel, king of Babylon. But the word Melech means, Mem is basically what to you? What were you told? Melech. Lamed Kaf is Laka, which means you were given direction. Mem is the prefix. What, what are the directions you were given? Babel is confusion, but Bet Bet is a gateway. Bet Lamed is nothing, void disappearance. Something doesn't exist. You were told about something that doesn't exist. You were told one of the lovers of Yahweh, the bride of Christ, those who want to be his dear ones, were told that if you have a wonderful Christmas tree and a service on, on um, the 24th and the 25th of December, that, that he likes that, you were lied to. He said not to do that. Oh, you were told that if you have an Easter sunrise service, and you have Easter eggs and bunny rabbits, and uh, you were lied to. Melek Babel, king of Babel. Well, we have plenty of water. Well, you might not after tomorrow, at least in America, if that big, big X over the country means something. Just maybe. You were given wrong direction and confused guidance led astray. That's what the words Melek Babel, oh, king of Babel, that's what that means. And then Aleph Tov hyphenated to Yod Kof Noon, Hey, uh, Yod Hey, Kof Noon, that's the word right in the middle, and it means yes, truly correct alignment. So you were led astray of the 
correct alignment or you will let astray, but he will provide correct alignment. The next word is Ben Yod He Vav Yahu Yod Kuf Yod Mem Yakim. Well, Kuf Yod Mem is a derivative of Yod Kuf Vav Mem, which means substance, existence, place established or founded. It's like Kuf, Kuf itself, that which rises up, that which placed, Kumi, Kumi Ori. So the word Yahu Yakim is Yahweh has placed, established, founded the Kaf Nun, the Yod Kaf Nun, the correct alignment, yes, truly. Well, that's how you know whether you've got the right deity, you're doing the right act of worship, you've got the right truth, is because he established a truth. It just so happens that it's correlated to the 22 letters of the alphabet in Hebrew, which are correlated to the Mishkan pattern, which are proven, held in registry by the Moedim and validated by the seven days of creation that Yahuwah, that Yeshua grabbed as the index for the Beatitudes, thus proving it. And it's held right there in the pattern of the Mishkan. The Melech Yahuda led, guided, and directed according to giving hod, yod, hevav, dalet, hey, giving praise, thanks. Hey, dalet is a joyous shout. It's like, in spite of the grandeur of the king of Babylon leading us astray, in spite of the fact that we've got 3,000 years of lies and distortions and confusions, and we don't even know if it's 3,000 years, but we have Melech Yahuda. Thank you. And Aleph Tov Shari, Shin Resh Yod, my song would be Shin Yod Resh, but the word for Shin Resh is prince, poet, bracelet chain, but it also means allowed permitted, set free, dwell, soak, steep. Well, that's that's a synonym with sin bet, Shabbat, to dwell, to just sit, like putting a tea bag. It's the word for bracelet chain or to open or to be free of the curse. Yahuda, once again, hod is to appreciate and express praise, thanks, splendor, glory, Glory, and then here's this word, Vav Aleph Tov, hyphenated with Hey Chet Shin Chet Reshin Harash. Well, wait a minute, that's the word used in Zechariah chapter two, where he said, "There's four horns, then there's these four Harashim Haresh, carpenters, artisans." The word Haresh means silent, deaf, mute, sylvan, thick, scary, dark, forest creepy, unintelligible words that nobody knows what they are. Engraving, like a carpenter, a worker in wood, metal, or pottery will carve into, scratch into. So one who plows open a field, it's, it, it means all that, but the way it's translated is simply carpenter or plowman or artisan. But it's Silent, deaf, mute. Well, that's words nobody understands. Kind of like Paleo Hebrew. To see Paleo Hebrew inscriptions that nobody can read. I mean, it could be cuneiform or it could be hieroglyphics, but it's that type of thing that you'd carve into wood, metal, or pottery. And then there's Aleph Tov, Hey, Mem, Samic, Gimel, Resh, Masagar. Well, Kuna Masagar. That's the word. Sagar literally means closed, bound up, or shut. You take tobacco and you roll it up real tight. And then if you have a big one, that's a cigar. And you got a little one, it's a cigarette. But the word mesigar, mem prefix, means the place of or that that which it means enclosure or prison. Like being put into a tomb. Like Ephraim being thrown into the lockdown diaspora. diaspora. The word mem in front means the one who... So it's either a picture frame or it's a locksmith, one who gets you out of, because mem is a prefix can mean away from, to get you out of being locked down, extradited. Well, that's then the word, hey, mem, samik, resh, compared to the melech of Babel, the king of Babel, or the teachings of wrong, confused guidance means, come out of her, my people. That's what he said in Revelation, right? And unless you partake in her plagues, and then you go back over, the next word is me'yur So it's 
either it's the place of come to, come out of Babylon and come to Jerusalem. Mem is the place of the object, but it's also a ray from Yod Reshvav Shin. Well, Reshvav Shin, Rosh, can mean poison, but Yod Resh can mean to show. In Spanish, the word spelled I R it means to go, to ear, to put out on a, to project, to run, as it were. Shin Lamed Mem is Shalam, which is complete, but Yod Resh Shin is to take possession, inherit, or seize, or catch. So there's a couple different ways to read this. But he's saying, by giving praise and thanks to the way we were guided and, guided and directed, obeying, hevav yod kuf is the word to obey, and kuf yod mem, when he says, the son of yahu yakim, yahoyakim, the place established. Obey the place established. <laughs> obey the Het Kuf. We were told to obey these terms of the covenant. And Ephraim, just so long as you lost your way and you're waking up, come back to Deuteronomy 30. When all these things that come upon you, the blessing and curse, I command you today, come back with all your heart and all your soul. And he's telling us, he's giving us the formula by which to escape. It's go back and decipher the engraving of the words that are silent, deaf, and mute. Paleo-Hebrew. Isn't this Erectology? Is that what he's saying? Of course, you wouldn't see it unless you're already doing the Erectology. And then it says, Vav Yod Bet Aleph Mem. Well, Bet Aleph is to come or arrive or import. Yod Bet Aleph, it will arrive. Aleph Mem Am is mother, but it's if or on the condition. And then Bet Bet Lamed, the gateway, Babylon, confusion. But Bet Lamed can also mean disappearance and Bet prefix in the condition of Lamed is the teach and learn. So you could say it will arrive the disappearance of the confusion. If we come back, and look at what Yahweh said, the confusion will disappear. If we come back to the take possession of the inheritance, isn't that what he said? What, what both Yaakov and Moshe said in the prophecy regarding Yosef, that when he wants this, well, Yosef wanted it. He was vizier of Egypt. He loved in the being in the position that Yahweh had called him to. In fact, he said to his brothers when they came to get food, he says, hey, you, know, you meant evil, but this was all for good. Look at my possession. I'm Vizier of Egypt, don't feel too bad about yourselves. What you did was dead wrong, but thank you. Thank you for doing the wrong thing you did because look, look what good has become of it. Yeah, but it's Ephraim that needs to come to the frame of mind that says, I want this more than anything. Want what? To be able to come back to the kingdom, to his position of stature in the kingdom as the headship as the generational inheritance of being of the house of Yosef. That's what he turned away from. That's the prodigal son story. So you could read the prodigal son story as Joseph with Ephraim and Manasseh. And Ephraim was just some stupid punk idiot kid. And when he got the whole idea of the pig, meaning one who returns, he was, we told this story before that, the prodigal son story, he was feeding the pigs because he was broke. And he goes, I wish I could eat the food of a pig. They have better food than I do. I, wait a minute. The word pig is chazir, which means one who returns. So he technically was saying, I wish I could eat the food of one who returns. That's the way Hebrew works. Like, like almond and industrious and diligent and like lover and basket, dodi. Two lovers. Yahweh has. Is that like the church and is Kadoshi of Israel? And one of them thinks that Yeshua is no good. That's the Jews. And one of them thinks that we don't need the Moedim. That's the Christians. And yet we've all been lied to. We've all been lied to. And it's just a matter of saying, and you could you could look, throw Islam in there, and you could throw the Hindus in there, and the Buddhists in there, and say, we've all been lied to. We've all inherited stuff. We've all got a good excuse. It's like, okay, forget all that. It's all Forget all that. Just come back to the truth. Where's the truth? Well, it's in these letters. And if you figure out what it means by 
being the locksmith of extraditing the truth from out of the words, that's those two words right there to come back and take possession of the inheritance and get rid of the dispersion. That's the end of verse one. Then he says, Hadud Achad, one of the beloved, or one of the baskets, the way it's translated, one of the beloved, and then the word Tav Aleph Nun Yod Mem. Tav Aleph, that's the word translated fig, but Tav Aleph means come. Come on, it's, it's an apartment, a compartment or a cell. Aleph Nun Yod means I am. It means, yes, here I'm coming. I'm just like Ephraim's attitude. Tovot, goodness. Tov, tet bet or tet va bet means goodness, and this is pluralized. Mem Aleph Dalit, madly, like Tav Aleph Nun Yod, like I am. Or like the, the Tav prefix, Tav or Kaf, Tav Aleph Nun Yod, Ani means I am. And then this, the Hey Bet Kaf Resh Vav Tav. Well, Bet Kaf Resh is firstborn, preferred to bring forth. It's like one of them says, I'm going to come back and do be good, like the firstborn of saying, I am. That's me. That's I'm, I'm taking this. Well, that's the attitude he wants us to have about his stuff. The beloved one, ha dud echad tav alef nun yod mem, to mark out a boundary of is tav alef nun. It's like, what's the boundary that's marked out? Leviticus 23, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, the covenant, and then resh ayin vav tav. Oh, that's bad. That's evil. But Rash Ayan is also intentions, thoughts, friend, noise, shouting, evil, harm, and wicked. Mem Aleph Dalit is very much that does not, cannot be eaten for the sake of its badness. Tav Aleph Kaf Lamed Nun Hey, Mem Rash Ayan. On account of its badness, it can't be eaten. And it's like, no, wait a minute. Aleph Kaf Lamed means to eat or be eaten. But kaf lamed means complete, finished, all. And it's like, wait a minute. The definition of evil is disobeying the Torah. The, dis the, the definition of righteousness is obeying the Torah. Well, this can't be eaten. What did the Torah say? It said, don't eat leavened bread for a week. That's the moed of Zadika, of righteousness, the, the moed of obeying Yahweh's voice. If Yahweh is your Elohim and you're his people, one of the Shabbats is to sit down on the seventh day. Another Shabbat, Shabbat Shabbaton, is to keep the Pesach meal on the evening of the, on the night of the 14th of the first month, in the month of Aviv, the springtime. And then the first day right after that, the net, starting that, that meal, eat unleavened bread for a week. That's the moed of Chag hamatzot, and the word matzot is not just matzah, unleavened bread, but it means find out how to do something. Find out how is matzah. So find out how to be his people. Find out how to be zealously like the firstborn, which also means to be preferred and bring forth forth the bakar. Find out how Ephraim can come home. Find make road markers for yourself. Also, the word for shield or billboard like stepping stones to, to mark out the path of returning home to your father's table, Ephraim. And what he said is, don't eat the forbidden fruit. Don't eat the leaven. Don't eat the pork. Don't eat the rat. Don't eat the catfish. Don't eat the crab. Ephraim, you want to come back to your father's table? You want to do what your father said? Or do you want to just pretend to be a lover with excuses? Down in verse three, and we're almost at the end here. Down in verse three, it says, he says to me, he says, Yahweh, the Vayamer Yahuwah Ali, Ma Ata, Rai, Yermayahu. And he says, Yahweh, to me, what do you see, Yermayahu? Vayamer, and said, Tav Aleph Nun Yod Mem, Hey Tav Aleph Nun Yod Mem, Ta'anim Ha Ta'anim, Ha Tovot Tovot, Mad, Ma'ad, Veha Ra'ot Ra'ot. That's the way the, the, the Hebrew works. When something is the same word repeated twice with one extra letter added, it was like Shema Shema, Shomer Shomer. 
Here he's saying, Tanim, Tanim, Tavot, Tavot, Ra'a, Ra'a. That, 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 that's just the way it works. But what he's saying is when he says Tanim, Tanim, it's like, well, this is a weep lament or uh, the pretext for a grievance. He's basically saying, this is the challenge. This is the issue. What did he say to eat? So when you go back to the Garden of Eden and says, why did he stick the tree there? Because it's a setup that if there's ever going to be a conflict, an issue, a grievance, an excuse, this is it. It's like you could say, listen, the cops want to bust people. So the cops are going to put a 30 mile an hour speed zone right in the middle of a 45 mile an hour speed zone where for the sake of two blocks, anybody caught going over 30 miles an hour is going to get a ticket. We're going to get money. Why would they want to say, hey, there's a place in Portland like that. You drive down this road, only it's, it's 35 or 45, also go to go 30. Then you can speed up again. And they've got these cameras and lights and everything. And they boom, boom, boom. They keep, why? Because they need money and this is where they're going to get it. Right here at this stretch. It's like, come on, why? It doesn't make any sense. They have a reason. It doesn't matter. It's the same type of, it's a setup. You're always saying, here's the setup. I'm going to tell you guys to eat unleavened bread for a week just to see who will do it. I'm going to tell you not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil just to see if you'll do it. I'm going to tell you not to work on Shabbat just to see if you'll do it. That's going to be the issue. Oh, we're going to sing songs. We're going to work like crazy on Saturday. We're going to do all kinds of stuff. But we're going to sing you beautiful songs on Sunday. And we're going to love Jesus with all our heart. And that should appeal. That should appease. That should make up for it, right? No, that's not what he said. That's not the conflict. So anybody who says, listen, we got a better covenant with better promises. But that's not the conflict. The conflict, he said, keep the Moedim. And the Christian church won't. However, we're going to jump ahead here to verse 7. Well, if you get to the tail end of verse 6, we're out of time here, but I'm going to just say the tail end of verse 6 says, Hazat, the this, ve benitaim, my son's construction or reconstructed, ve lo, E haras. Well, that word haras, heresh samik, is where we get the word haras, which means throw down, tear apart, destroy, or ruin. With the aleph prefixes, I'm not going to tear down, tear apart, destroy, or ruin. Vav nun tet ayin tav yod mim. Well, tav yod mim, that's the suffix. Vav nun, that's the prefix. Tav or nun tet ayin means to plant, planted, or plantation. Tet ayin has to do with carry a load or to be sued as a defendant. So this is the tail end of the verse where he says, uh, here, I'll go back to the beginning of verse six. Va shamati, I have there, ayin yod nun yod, my eye, weigh, measure, balance, ayin lamed yod hey mem, promoting them, latova, for good, veha shabbatim, and the Sabbaths, Al Haaretz belonging to the earth, this constructing. In other words, he's saying, listen, I had you taken into captivity, and whoever of you survived 2,730 years, or in this case, taken into the king of Babylon for 70 years, it was for good. The land needed to rest, and he needed to fulfill the whole story. And he said, it'll be multiplied by seven, so it was multiplied by seven, so just just calm down, everybody. I mean, yeah, it was a Holocaust and it was an Inquisition and it was world wars, but it was for good. Just, just let it go. Now, just be present tense with your mind and saying, this Zion Aleph Tov, this specifically this Aleph Tov reconstructing, I will not destroy, and I you'll you won't be sued as a defendant, but it says, and lo, and no, aleph tav vav shin. Well, tav vav shin means advice, insight, wisdom, resourcefulness, orientation, philosophy. It's almost like, it seems like what he's saying is here, he says, I realize you didn't know the difference. I realize you were lied to. I realize you were, you thought you loved me, but what you did was exactly what I said not to do. You had a wonderful 
ham on Christmas and Easter to celebrate my love for you and coming here as your savior. But I told you not to eat ham and I told you not to mix with pagan cultural ceremonies. And that's exactly what you're doing out of love. It's almost like he's saying, I'm not going to sue you as a defendant. I'm not going to destroy you. However, it, get, it sets up number verse number seven. Venatati lachem love ledaat ati ki ani yahua ve hayo li laam ve anoki ehie lahem la elohim ki yashuvo ali bakalavem. I will give or teach to them heart to know. Me, Aleph Tav Yod, my Aleph Tav. I will give, I'm not going to, I'm not going to destroy you. And I'm not going to, you might say, either absolve you, sue you as a defendant, or I'm going to give you to know my heart. I'm going to give you a heart to know my Aleph Tav because Ani Yahweh, I am Yahweh and I exist and exist for me as people. Ve'anoki ehye, and I am, I am, lahem as Elohim. I am for them as Elohim. When, kaf yod, yod shin bet vav, they return to sit, to dwell, to repent, to regret, aleph lamed yod, to me, bekal lavem, with all their heart. So here, verse 7 of Jeremiah 24 is a reiteration of Jeremiah 31, return to me with all your heart, and Deuteronomy 30, return to me with all your heart. And how do we know we've returned to him with all our heart? Because in Deuteronomy 30, Moshe said, you will return to these words I command you this day with all your heart and with all your soul, so that you will understand what he said. You'll look at his words, you'll sit down on his day. And as long then as if the if the, if uh, let me just put it this way, and according to my understanding, as feeble as it might be, for the Jews to hate Yeshua, it's because he represents Jesus Christ of the Christian Church, which represents contrary to the Torah. But if the Jews could see that Yeshua is the one who's the Mashiach of Israel in these twenty-two letters, that he died, that he rose again, that he ascended and coming back, and all authority is given unto him in heaven and on earth, it's their king, king of the Jews. And that they should appreciate him. That the that the people who were that are under the influence of, let's say, uh, Islam, such as it is, realize that they are, if they claim to be of the lineage of Abraham, then they have a right to be of this covenant agreement as well. And the Christians who think that they have to not keep Shabbat and not be under the shelter of the law, the Betzal of the Chuk. If they think they're honoring Jesus, they're dishonoring Yeshua by having that mind because they've been lied to. And if they come back to these matters, it's a matter of restoring the kingship to the head of Yosef, which was prophesied that it had to happen by both Yaakov and Moshe. And so the reading of this, the doing of this looks like well, that's this time. It's the harash of the Masagar. Pretty spectacular, I think. Anyway, we're we should be at the end of time here, I believe, right, Carla? Yeah, we're yeah. good now. No. Okay. Well, praise Sava for this gathering, for this day. <laughs> Praise thee, Abba, for the revelation of thy word. We thank thee, Abba. We exalt thy name. Thou art so amazing, so patient, and so loving that even through our hardship, thou art there, and thou keeps assuring us, Father, that yes, we, it, there is a, a purpose. We may not understand it, but thou knows it clearly. And it is for our good. We praise thee and we thank thee. Amen. 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 Amen.